Okay, so now we're being recorded, uh, and I guess we can we can kick off. Ricard has uh, been kind enough to help with notes. Um, the in the WebEx chat, I posted the Etherpad link, so please go there and put your name into the roster as being present. And I guess I'll be screen sharing, and Militia will be doing all the intelligence sharing today. Um, and with that, I guess over to you, Alicia. Just say say when you want me to hit the next button. Uh, yeah. Okay. Sure. So I was just filling in the names uh, for the in the in the notes, but if people could do it themselves, that would be great. So welcome everyone to the Lake Interim uh, Lake Working Group Interim Meeting. Uh, so. Uh, as you know, this is the last meeting that we will have before the ITF 111. And today we scheduled two hours. Uh, I'm not sure if we will need all that time. Uh, we have several issues to discuss. Uh, and then I guess we can take some time uh, during the discussion in order to tackle those uh, those problems that we have, those issues that we have in the, in the spec. So, uh, Stephen, could you go to the next slide, please? Yeah, so this is an ITF meeting, so the note well applies. If you're not familiar, please go and uh, read uh, these uh, BCPs that are listed down here. And most, and notably, if you are aware of any uh, intellectual property rights that are being discussed, uh, please disclose them uh, or do not participate in the discussion. Uh, next slide, please. So here is the proposed agenda for the day. Uh, right now we have a note taker, I believe this is Rickard, Rickard, big thanks. And if you need any help, uh, just shout here or, or in the chat with note taking. Uh, I'll also maybe try to, to help you out, uh, depending on how the meeting goes. Uh, so essentially we have a short report from the last interrupt report, uh, from the last interrupt testing event, uh, that was held online by Marco. And then we'll jump right into the meat of the meeting uh, and discuss the latest changes of the ad hoc spec uh, in 07 version and the open issues that the author team has prepared. Uh, does anyone want to bash this agenda? Okay. I don't hear any objections to the proposed agenda, so I propose we proceed. Stephen, could you go ahead and share Marco's presentation? Yeah, there it is. Marco, can you hear us? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, we hear you perfectly. Okay, the floor is yours. Great. Uh, this is a short report of the latest rounds of testing we had for ad hoc. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, we had some more bilateral tests already uh, following the previous intern meeting in April, but then we also had a main uh, actual interop event uh, a few weeks ago, around mid-May. Um, overall, we consider three implementations. None of them are brand new, but it's the, the first time we consider the, the following reported tests uh, against these implementations in those particular um, test configurations. So it's uh, my implementation again for Californium, uh, Christians for IOCOA building on Timothy's implementation, and um, Lydia again uh, with her implementation for um, ContiKNG. And overall, putting together implementers and observers, um, it's roughly 10 people that participated um, in the different uh, events. Um, as usual, you can follow that link and find a lot of resources uh, related to testing. So. A spreadsheet where we cumulatively uh, collect um, what implementations support and the tests overall uh, happened uh, with what configurations. And then for each pair of uh, implementers, you can find a dedicated uh, Google Docs where we collect the, the raw output from the tests that uh, sounded like an overkill at the beginning, but it was useful apparently for some implementers, especially. Uh, I, don't, I don't recall who exactly. Uh, Stefan. <laughs> Next slide, please. Yeah, uh, the first bunch of tests and the largest one was between uh, Mark and Christ, uh, me and Christian. We consider especially um, Cypress with zero uh, with authentication methods zero and three, both directions, things worked. 
uh, then 7C2, uh, all authentication methods, uh, both directions, everything worked. And 7C3, again, all authentication method. Uh, due to lack of time, we went for uh, one direction only, and it didn't seem any way that the other direction could add anything um, useful. And for all of these tests, we, um, we focused on the credential type uh, KID. Uh, next slide, please. And yeah, finally, Lydia had also the opportunity to, to, to test uh, other than me also with Christian for the first time. And that test focused on um, what Lydia exactly support uh, with her uh, contingency implementation. So um, CyberC2 and exactly with authentication method um, three. Uh, one direction was tested and worked. Uh, the other one was work in progress, mostly due to connectivity issues and will be most likely tested the next time. And here again, uh, credential type KID. Uh, next slide, please. Um, yeah, before scheduling any other uh, actual uh, interop event, uh, we agreed to wait for version eight of the draft um, with number of changes in the queue and hopefully also updated test vectors to consider. And once we have two or three implementations aligned uh, with the upcoming version eight, we'll, we'll resume the tests and more likely, most likely set up also an actual uh, interop event. And that should be it from my side. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Marco. I mean, this is great. Uh, so I think this is this really makes sense. I think I was just going through the issues in in GitHub and all the changes that happened with uh, from zero six to zero seven, and uh, the test vectors are affected. And there are also, from what I can see, uh, many uh, many changes that are coming, and also that will affect the implementations. Uh, so just one quick question on Lydia's implementation. You say it's Contiki NG, and since Lydia is not here, maybe you can answer. Uh, is this merged in the official Contiki NG, or this is just a fork, uh, uh, their own fork? I don't the think it's merged. I mean, I suggest to double check with her, but I don't think it's merged. It, it, okay. it was the research work in their, in their environment. Okay, and so you probably don't know about the plans either then? Uh, no, I, I don't. Plan. I don't okay. either. Okay, okay. Yeah, so maybe we should discuss this with the uh, developers of Contiki and G, if this would be interesting for them to, to be merged, I guess. Yeah. We'll see. So, yeah, okay. Uh, yeah, so thanks. Do we have any other questions for Marco? Okay, I hear none. Uh, so I proceed then. Yeah. Uh, I, yeah, thanks, Marco. I propose that we proceed with the uh, with the ad hoc issue slide set uh, that John and Joran uh, lead. I'm not sure who will be presenting what, but I think both John and Joran are on the call. So yeah, John, you me, you want to start? Should I do it? Uh, I don't know. Maybe you can start. OK, I'll start. And then you fill in the details. Great. OK, next slide, please. OK, so yeah, this slide set contains one slide on the main changes in the latest version, 0 07, and then uh, uh, five, six slides on, on selected issues. Maybe just high level, um, I think, we are reaching some some degree of maturity in this work and we face today we want to discuss a number of issues that uh, relates to some some features we added nine months ago uh, which we want to take out <laughs> it's a little bit like we've somehow reached uh, some degree of, of uh, uh, sort of reflections on on the um, on, on the things that we are doing, so I, I think we are we are really really converging now. But it, it, it's of course would be nice if we could progress always in the same direction. But so here we are, and uh, I think we have had a really fortunate uh, that we have this this good discussion with the implementers. We have one had one design team meeting uh, just uh, the day before the, the latest interop, uh, and that that type of feedback is really. Uh, Great input to this work. So, but let's let's uh, get started. Next slide, please. 
so these were the changes uh, between previous version. This version, uh, very briefly condensed here. The reason for this release was that essentially that we had reached so many changes that we thought that this is time to make a drop um, without completing the, all the changes that are in the pipe. So there are some that we should discuss today as well. Um, but anyway, this, this, it made sense to make, make this uh, intermediate version, but we didn't update the test vectors. So um, basically test vectors are, are the things that are not, not changed from, from, they are still the previous version. Um, so let's let's go through the changes. And there was a change in the definition of the transcript hash, um, and this was based on input from from Inria, um, and that makes it makes sense because it sort of minimizes what needs to be cached between when you uh, when you send a message, you're using some data for verifying integrity when you receive a message, and that data can be can be hashed, um, which makes it more, more complex. That, that, that there were already something of that in the spec, but there were more added now, more components that were hashed. Very good input. Um, I think that change is, is very clear. Um, then uh, there was a change in the Cypher Suite definition. So there, were, there are a number of parameters in the Cypher Suite, and <clears throat> the particular ad hoc signature algorithm curve uh, should probably not be in the Cypher suite because it's determined by, by the public key parameter. So, so that was removed and it, it's essentially duplicated in most of the Cypher suites. So it, it makes sense from that point of view as well. I don't know, do you want to add more about that, John? Why exactly why we removed it? Uh, yeah, yeah, that was one reason. The other reason is that uh, there's no reason why ad hoc would not support, for example, hash-based signature algorithms and so on. And yeah. they would they would not even have a curve in the in the public key format exactly okay so that was quite a kind of simple change but still uh, and so we removed one item from the cypher suite uh, next change was the um the context parameter there is a new application defined parameter called context in the ad hoc exporter and the purpose and there is also a new ayana registry where these context contexts are these labels are, are registered and this is to ensure different keys for different contexts so we don't accidentally get um, a collision there that was also an input from from uh, in real um, and then a, a change that we actually haven't discussed in a meeting uh, which we discussed it in in github um, so it's there is uh, Previously, there was in section seven to one a description of how you derive the master secret from OS, for OSCORE uh, based on the ad hoc exporter, which is defined in section four. And we have uh, this other draft in, in core, who is, which is describing how to use ad hoc to key OSCORE. So we thought it would make sense. We also checked with the authors of that draft to, to move this this part of the key derivation from, from this draft to the core draft. Uh, so that, that's, I don't know, that we haven't discussed that. Maybe some people have some concerns about that. This is a good time to, to uh, raise that. Or if you, I mean, this is anyway for your information. So if you have, if you want to bring it up, um, uh, this is a good time. <laughs> Yeah, so maybe I can comment on that. Uh, I didn't, I didn't really uh, that issue in GitHub kind of slipped away, so I didn't see it when it was merged. Uh, my first comment when I was going through this uh, through this list of changes and this particular issue that you were discussing is that uh, with this change we are kind of uh, uh, removing the link between ad hoc and OSCORE in our core specification, and the Lake Charter is pretty explicit that we need to produce an ache for a score. So my concern is that when we push the document to the ISG, there could be arguments uh, that, that we are maybe too generic or that we are not really meeting that charter item that we need to produce. 
So I would like to open this for discussion. Maybe if anyone else could give uh, could share thoughts. If you think that removing this particular link between ad hoc and OSCOR from the core ad hoc specification is good from the strategic point of view of the working group. Nobody has. Maybe I can give some. So I think this was this discussion was probably originally started by me, but mostly on very transport specific parts, uh, specific co-op and OSCOR trans transport specific parts that started at some point. There was a lot of very core specific details that was discussed in the in github and also in started to propagate into outside of the co-op and oscor sections of the ad hoc draft and then i suggested to th that maybe some parts should be moved to four uh, without as specifically mentioning the key derivation i think that could be in either uh, part um, Okay, so if I'm understanding you right, essentially this draft, I haven't tried, have, to be honest, I haven't read the core draft, OSCOR ad hoc. Last time when I read it, I think this was referring to how you transport ad hoc, uh, uh, how you transport OSCOR in ad hoc, right? Uh, if, uh, if I'm not mistaken. So then Vice I versa. get. Uh, uh, Vice versa. How you transport ad hoc in OSCOR, but anyway. Ad hoc, yes, so ad hoc in OSCOR, in message, yes, in message three, exactly, yeah, uh, yeah, so, so I guess the scope there got extended, but I mean, I think it would be good from, from the point of view of like to keep this link on uh, the derivation of the OSCOR master secret and master salt in, in the main document. This is, this is my, um, this is my view based on the pull request and based on this change that was made. Stephen, do you have any comments on this? Not really. I mean, I guess we're looking at section what was section seven two one of draft six, which essentially has been replaced with a reference to the core OS core ad hoc draft. Uh, Correct. Do we have any information about the the likely progression of that other draft? Marco, you it to... was adopted. Yeah, it was adopted at the previous ITF meeting, and this content from Blake has just been uh, moved, so to say. And we anticipate it will grow more other than just key derivation. Um, anticipating possible changes in ADOC about uh, connection identifiers, we may require rules for translating back and forth between ADOC identifiers and OSCOR identifiers, so to say. So I understand this was originally possibly all for EDOC and all for Lake. Um, it's becoming more and more um, specific to co-op and OSCOR where it kind of feels like appropriate to do that in core, at least that part. Um, I still see EDOC as appropriate for, for OSCOR anyway as happening um, as a design of an AK, mainly, mainly Lake, of course. Uh, but that part and the binding with OSCOR is becoming more and more detailed. Uh, if I if I may say something, I, I think that this particular section seven to one could be in either draft actually. So th there are other discussions related to. The, I mean, the, the connection identifiers are negotiated in ad hoc, and they need to have special uh, there are special constraints for them. In OSCOR, and that that's that's a dependency we may want to elaborate on in in the other draft or in the core draft. But the but key derivation, as such, I think could remain here if, if people think that's uh, important. Yeah, I I think key derivation could go in either draft. I'm I would be perfectly fine to moving it back. I think the the reason behind this change was not in any way to make ad hoc less. Uh, less of a key management protocol for OSCOR. But, um, but yes, to 
make sure that the co-op specific interactions like maximum amount of transmission and transmission type and, and stuff like that are, are, are discussed in core and the broad and the scope of what used to be draft Palombini. I don't remember what it's called today. Yeah, that, that's this draft. Uh, as it's, I, I don't think, I, it's like in draft ITF core or score ad hoc. Okay, so no object. Malicia has a slight preference for, or a, a strong preference for moving back the key derivation. John and I have no a kind of neutral. Marco is uh, slightly in favor of keeping it. Or can we come to an agreement here what we should do? The key derivation can also get back to ad hoc. We probably have to synchronize the detail of um, what is happening now in, in the core draft to avoid strange cross references. But mm. <laughs> I, I think the way we have adapted in the core draft the key derivation text now considers also uh, placeholder text still in that draft for the translation of identifiers. So we may risk some some loop in, in the references, but. <laughs> okay, I think I think this really boils down to the detail and how it is implemented in the uh, in the different specifications. So uh, I, I I can take uh, an action point to go back and check in this draft and maybe propose a version that would be uh, that would still be let's say compliant with the lake charter in that we are very specific that we are producing an an NAKE that is tailored for OSCOR that works with OSCOR, but that also doesn't take into account all the core specificities and details into this document. Yeah, so I can, I can maybe, maybe the best way forward is to reopen that issue. And then we continue discussing on the GitHub. Would that work for everyone? Yes, fine. That's good. Okay, so let's note in the minutes then that uh, an action point to reopen the issue. I'm not sure which issue exactly this one is, but the, the issue 75, yes, and uh, yes, and for for myself to uh, give a proposal on how we can best tackle this and this this situation. Okay. Okay. Good. Yeah. Let's okay. Move on. Yeah. Yes, please. Um. The next change is in the normative language on failures and sending errors. So previously, we stated that in case of failure, you must send an error. And that is now uh, in light of potential denial of service uh, attacks that could, could use this, uh, this feature or this, this uh, type of phenomenon. So, so we are actually tuning this down now. So it's actually should, in case of failure, should send error, but we still keep that if you send error, you must discontinue. So that, that still remains, but it's just to, to be able to handle certain situations where you, uh, where you get um, single errors that leads to complete failures of messages, uh, failure of protocols. To avoid that, um, we have now Made this should. Any comments on that? I think we discussed it previously. Um, then some minor changes on, on error codes. Uh, so we the, the, still the same three error codes are present, um, but we have now made success have number zero and all error codes non negative. Based on input from IoT ops, I uh, I think all registered error codes are non-negative. If I remember, right, the, it's still allowed. Yeah, it still allows negative. Yeah, yeah. Although IoT ops feedback was to use non-negative error codes, so so there are some are complying with their recommendation there, but we don't disallow the other negative. Um, yeah, any more comments on this? We've been talking about error codes for some time. And this is the latest proposal. We don't have any, <laughs> foresee any more changes at the moment now. But um, yeah, there we are. 
there is also some more details on success error codes, uh, success error code, um, that it's not used in transmission. Uh, it may be used in logging, for example, but it's not intended. We don't explicitly send the success error code uh, in any message. It was introduced oh, again a recommendation from IoT Ops to have to have a dedicated number for success. Maybe add that uh, like uh, the terminology, the use of zero for success is is very very standard in like operating systems and like and programming languages. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, then we had a new appendix on compact EC point representation. Uh, so that uh, make clear that we are using the compact representation and uh, also the representation of the y coordinate uh, is specified there, and that it's also added uh, to the section on ephemeral public keys that they are always represented by the compact representation. Mm, right. So this was. Um... This was based on a discussion and uh, suggestion in CFRG of the HPKE uh, draft of the point format there. And one suggestion there was that ad hoc should more formalize this, this format so it could be used by other specifications in the future. So there is no no change to the to the protocol it's just that this section on how to represent the point has been made a little bit more formal in its own section so it can be used uh, for for other specifications i think it's also a better written section now and we removed the uh, before it stated that the, the the receiver could choose zero of or one for the sign bit of the y coordinate, which is secure, but it seems easier to just fix it to to zero. Thanks, John. Uh, next, just a terminology thing. We removed the term protocol instance, and everything is now called session. Uh, it's also a renaming of auxiliary data, there's been this constant confusion on what was previously called application data and then auxiliary data, which is not at all intended to be arbitrary application data, but to be very specifically used by other security protocols, in particular for the author carrying authorization information like uh, vouchers and access tokens. So we have now renamed it to external authorization data to make that clear. So that's renaming, and there's also some text explaining this. But there is no change to the protocol, except for that we also added this external authorization data for to message four. So you may carry that in message four as well. And it's uh, that led to a change. The message four was previously Mac because there were nothing to encrypt, and now there is an encrypt instead of a Mac. Right, and then there were some additional security considerations. I don't remember exactly what, but there were some added clarifications on certain things. Let's see if I can find them. Do you remember, John? Um, no, there are some, uh, maybe the TEE are. That's right. Maybe they're old, there's still an open issue, but I think these are small details about that but i and i don't remember what the security consideration was for zero seven yeah there was a little bit on i find it nice a little bit on the uh, denial of service uh aspect uh send, sending fake messages and there was this, this trusted execution environment uh the text on trusted execution environments and use of that with the keys in ad hoc i think that was the main changes Okay, so this, these were the changes, and let's, uh, if, unless there are any other questions on this, let's move on to the issues. And these are the issues we'd like to discuss. If there are other issues, people can bring them up. I think we will have plenty of time. 
and this is 90 minutes still left and there are like five groups uh these two two big groups and then some some individual items and the first group is relating to something we discussed a number of meetings it's about how to uh, transport raw public keys and the format and the identification of those uh, the second group relates to what we discussed in the design team meeting the correlation of messages um, and how that's used to optimize the message size and how that impacts the message format and then there are uh, three three issues one on, on connection and key identifiers and how to compactly represent them and, and a proposed change there uh, there is a new proposal for the inner mac in message 2 and message 3 and finally some thoughts around initial set of cipher suites so let's go to the first group next slide please so this deals um, with the question of how to handle raw public keys in a uh, in a somehow uniform way so we already have discussed uh, so to, how to handle transport uh, and uh, reference of certificates and also um, how to reference raw public keys with key identifiers but what needs to um, be sorted out is how do we if we want to send the raw public key by value what format should we use what should we expect and which cozy header should be used so typically uh, in the construction in the protocol is that you would use the id cred x this is identifier or the credential uh, which can contain the identifier but it can also contain the actual credential uh, and that would be you would uh, you would index that with the cozy header and then you would send the credential so uh, and how would you do this for, for raw public that's the, basically the question and before we go into that let's note that we have a related problem uh, in the draft and that's in the case we are not transporting the raw public keys we still need the credx a definition of credx to be used uh, for integrity verification on both sides uh, on both endpoints and they need to use the same representation of the raw public key in order for the integrity to, to verify and in this case we we have in the current or previous version we have the what you see on the right here the credx in case of a cosy it's a cosy key uh, and it's an ordered subset of a cosy key and it's also adding subject name which is not part of a cosy key really and it's ordered in in a certain order here with the, the, the indexes the labels are ordered so that's what we're using today to ensure that raw public keys are the same uh, are interpreted the same credential on 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 the initiate and responder side that's also something that we uh, we now think that we should should harmonize with with something that we define as a raw public key. So next slide, please. So here are different candidates for for how to specify uh, raw public keys. We could we could use a plain cozy key like we do in the in on the example in the previous slide. What is missing uh, there as as we saw that we need to add, add this label for subject name we need to have a deterministic encoding and we need to define a cozy header so that it's it, the receiving side understand what what am i receiving i'm receiving this particular type of, of, of cozy key so that's one solution another alternative is that we use a CBOR web token that's on the upper uh, right um, side of this slide uh, and in this case, um, this is defined in in, in uh, RFC eighty seven forty seven. I think it's, it's basically this is a, a CWT claims list containing the conf confirmation CNF confirmation claim. After which you could uh, you can have a cozy key that's type one of this confirmation uh, claim, and then you can have the actual cozy key. And here you can also in, insert things like subject names and key ops and so on, uh, indicating key usage. 
so that, that would be one version. It needs to be deterministically encoded, and we need to define a cozy header because there is no cozy header defined for Seaboard Web Tokens. Uh, one issue here is that a Seaboard Web Token is actually not a Seaboard Web Tokens claims list. It's a Seaboard Web Tokens claims list included in a uh, cozy encrypt or a cozy sign or a cozy Mac. So this would be sort of the inner part of, of the CWT. And that also needs to be specified that we are only using the CWT claims list. So it's a little bit non-standard. Still, that's, that's one way to go. Um, um, yeah, and th there is a draft in red, it's called UCCS, which is for naked CWT claims lists. Ah, didn't know that. Okay, so that's, that's at least one step on the, on the same road then. So is it, is it exactly doing what we're saying here? It's basically, so this would be an object in that. I think so. <laughs> in, okay, okay, let's have a look at that. Thanks, Carson. So Carson, can you put a link to that draft somewhere in Bass or Jabber or something? Sure, sure. Thank you. Uh, good, uh, the next candidate is um, that we actually use a, CW, a real CWT, which is a signed object, um, like a cozy sign of, of this thing up to the right here. And that, um, that would then be standard CWT, but it would have the overhead of the signature, which we may not always want. Uh, and on the topic of using signed objects, we could use a self-signed C519. So C519 is this uh, we adopted draft in COSI about Seaboard encoding of X509 certificates. And that is, uh, so what you see here on the right hand side is the C509 uh, with, uh, which essentially doesn't have much content. It, it's a, it only has a subject name, in this case, an UIC64, uh, and then it has sort of the, the things related to the key the algorithm uh, and, and the uh, public key and the, and the digital signature. In this case, it's excluding the, sig uh, uh, the actual signature. So this, this, uh, this would be so corresponding to the case four here, where it's a C509 without the signature. So it would be a new type of C509. So those were about the options we were thinking about. I don't know if there are other options that people think about or our preferences. What? Yeah, the floor is, is the, 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 the mic queue is open. Any, any comments? Yes, I just mentioned that this was discussed in the COSI working group interim a few weeks ago. And then I think we presented one, three, four as options and several people suggested why not use CW. T here. Yeah. Uh, do we have any information on how do these compare in terms of message overhead? I think a raw an, a CVT claims list only. Uh, and um, th this four C509 C without signature would be about the same size. Um, so I think four should probably not be designed. Um, I think three would be like a claim list only CWT plus 64 bytes. And that like self signed certificates are already standardize how you transport them with with COSI. So that's already supported if you would want to use that. But I think CVT is probably the best choice here. If you have a CVT, a full CVT, then it, you would have, um, I don't know, eight more bytes for a tag and then some more header information. I don't know if it's 10 or 12 bytes or 16 bytes more yeah. than the raw. Um, I think the overhead is maybe 10, 10 by it. You have a raw public key, 32 bytes, then maybe 10 bytes uh, overhead 
for for the rest and then maybe if you want to have encrypt cozy encrypt around it maybe 10 more bytes or 12 or something but that is considerate right i mean we are we're talking about 50 bytes in total i mean i understand okay the the raw crypto is 32 32 bytes uh so i'm just thinking whether we could um, maybe propose our own structure specifically in cozy this would get standardized for this very specific use case i i don't know if it's yeah i think somebody should uh, calculate some more numbers so we can discuss but after seeing i don't know i think you want the flexibility that cwt supports where you can have a subject and you can have a uh, key ops or key usage part and other things so i'm not sure as long as we can get a naked like claims list only cwt i think there is no reason to de design anything more uh, more more lightweight i think you would only save mm -hmm. a few bytes okay. then but my my suggestion here would be to design a cozy header that can carry a full CWT or a claims list only CWT citing this rats draft. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. I see. And just for my understanding option three, uh, what is the added benefit of the uh, signature? In this case, the signature is not. I mean, basically, it's already ready to use. You have cozy headers, at least for the self-signed C509. You have you have a header. It's defined elsewhere. We don't need to define it. It's I see, but I mean, I'm just thinking in terms of conceptually in terms of the, the signature over the over the Euro public key. Is no, there it doesn't. Benefit? It doesn't add anything. No. No. Okay. As so, you already have. Uh, you have proof of possession in at least not when you use it in ad hoc then you already have proof of possession yeah yes and it's a significant overhead so i'm not sure why no would we use that yeah i think four here is already support you can also have a self-signed x509 that is supported but as you say there's a lot of overhead so i think a claims list only cwt is probably the way to go yeah. as the recommended option for this so i think um, one of you i i, I had to uh, mention that there's some kind of canonicalization requirements or fixed ordering requirements for use in ad hoc can you just clarify that, that i didn't catch it uh, yeah you, you definitely need to have a you need to put the same thing in the aad i coming to wt i don't know if that's given by the cwt the specification or if you need to just specify that the deterministic seabor shall be used I, I assume Karsten can answer that sorry I was distracted yeah how, how do you make yours it's does the CWT already include deterministic CBOR encoding or do you need to add that on top of CWT? Well, if you want deterministic encoding, you have to say that. I don't think that CWT includes that. Yeah, but that's, but that's basically just the reference to the deterministic part of the CBOR specification I think you've done. Okay, so so if you wanted to use that here, then you just say you know include a CWT, and then the when the when the ad hoc code is constructing the additional data, it has to use the deterministic encoding. Yeah. Okay. That's thank you. Well. Could we define that in our cozy header? So when we when we say the cozy header for for this CWT claims list, refer, referring to this rat strap. Could we say that then it should be, should be deterministically encoded? Is that something we can require in order to use this cozy header? So can you explain to me why we need this to be deterministic? 
So we had we had two cases in the previous slide. We had had another example where we definitely need to have it deterministic, and that's when we use it when we are not sending it. Yeah. We, we would like to have the same credential to be used ah. for when we not send and when we send. Got it. Same and then we definitely need to be. <clears throat> but that, that also means that you have to have very strict rules what actually goes in there and what doesn't. So it's not just the, the encoding that needs to be deterministic, but also the whole makeup of, of the structure. Yep, that's the, at least that's what it is currently in the draft. It, it, okay. it's, a, it's, a, it's a homemade struct, cozy key structure with added yep. subject, yeah, and in a certain order. Yeah, I think that using CWT plus the deterministic uh, rules from 8949 should do that. Yeah, that's, that's been my understanding too. That would be sufficient. So, but you are right in that in, in what we transport it, it the order is not, uh, yeah, I, I don't know, is it, how about parsing this would, would sort of, if you send it in one, one, uh, would, if you send the CWT claims list, could you, could it end up in different order when it's sort of on the other side? Uh, could the claims be in a different order? There is no really ordering by this, by definition of the CWT, is it? I don't think so. So then we have a problem if we include it in, in the external uh, AAD, for example. Is there any ever any use case for a non-ordered CWT? Like coming from a security background, why why was it defined like non-ordered from the start? Is there any use cases that requires that, or is it just because you want to add things on the on the go? Uh, well, it's the the JSON legacy, <laughs> so uh, we might want to get rid of that. Yes. Is that some input to provide to this this draft UCCS draft as well? Good, good question. I think that should be brought up with the authors. That's you. <laughs> well, I'm just <laughs> one of them. Others. <laughs> yeah. Will you bring it up with the other authors, or do you want some input? I do, yes. Sorry, I didn't understand. Did, did you want, will you do it? Yeah, you will, you will do it. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> and and yeah, yes to note, if, if we define the header for CWT, that would also bring in CWT as a full-fledged option for credentials in ad hoc, not only for this uh, 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 raw public key opportunistic use case. Uh, Carson, on the topic of, of trying to get other people to do, do work, um, could you consider to define the cozy header also in, in this uh, draft? Basically, it's the same type of tag which we have for KID and for X5T, that type of header. I could, I'm a little bit underwater at the moment. Okay. <laughs> we, we can see where it, I mean, it doesn't matter where it ends up, but it yeah. could make sense to do it there, I suppose. I, I will certainly it. review it. We already have a pull request for a tag, a header parameter. Okay. Okay. Yes, you know your. I didn't know, uh, but I would uh, would be happy to move that to the other draft. I think it just needs to be fi find somewhere. So just on on, a, on the issue of moving things around between different drafts, uh, let's all remember cluster two thirty eight. You don't necessarily want to have lots of interdependencies between drafts and multiple working groups, because that can just get out of hand and end up as a disaster. So. Do that with care, and, and I think, and only, only try and put your text into drafts that are nearly finished elsewhere. I think that's that would be my guidance. Thanks. You should think about that. 
Okay. Anything else to bring up on on this? I think we have a we have a proposed way forward here. We don't know exactly where text in which draft text should go, but we have an idea on what to write. I think. Yeah. I, I guess the if to summarize the idea is to define a head cozy header parameter for CWT, which can carry either one parameter that can carry a full CWT and a uh, claims list only CWT or two different header parameters, one for each. And then I, I think that should also be brought up in the cozy working group for discussion and see whether they like that idea. Yeah, good summary. And the deterministic encoding should be part of of the definition. Okay, next slide then. Uh, correlation. Do you want to take this, John? Or do you want me to start again? Yeah, I can take it if you if you want. So there has been um, a lot and a long discussion about correlation. So, uh, so first there is a there is a correlation parameter that is send in message one. How you should uh, what kind of correlate underlying correlation you have in the transport layer? For example, are you using co-op request response? And in 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 that case, in, in who is the client and who is the server there is also connection identifiers in in ad hoc in each package in message one message two message three and message four and these are present or not present based on the correlation uh, and ad hoc uh, transports and negotiate these parameters c i and c r uh, there's been a lot of different comments here from implementers uh, uh, one has been that this is this is hard to understand and how do i know what to to set and then earlier version of the draft at least was not not clear on how you were uh, definitely not clear on how you were supposed to find the the state and how to do this process. I think the current version is is clear, but there's still a lot of um, comments about uh, to, to have identify messages with um, based on the content of the message, and it's unclear whether that is is there something missing in the implementation or is there something missing in the draft. Um, a recent comment suggestion by Christian, which was discussed at the uh, design meeting, was to take out the correlation parameters from ad hoc and move that to a shim layer discussed in an appendix. And I think there was no agreement to do this at the design meeting, but there was an agreement that this seemed like a promising way. And there was an AP to on Christian to uh, do a PR with these changes that could then be discussed. And I think so far these changes has been uh, positively received. Uh, moving it, making it clear that this is more uh, on the transport layer. The application has some benefits. Um, because you, you have a better understanding for this and according to Christian, it also makes the uh, it much easier to understand when you get rid of some uh, some complexity by having client server initiator responder and so on. Um, another discussion suggestion was to just make all these mandatory to always have that increases the message size where it's not strictly necessary. Um, so I think th these are all very much transport things, but uh, the reason that they were in ad hoc was to try to simplify things. But if it only adds complexity, I think this appendix approach might be 
better. Um, do you have anything to, I think that's where we are right now. We have a PR with Christian's uh, suggestion that needs to be discussed more. Uh, and yes, I agree, with the, I agree with that assessment, John. Uh, I, I went through the PR before the meeting and I think, well, I, I was a little reluctant uh, on doing this change as proposed during the design team meetings. Once going through the PR, it really does simplify the, the specification. Uh, so in terms of purely editorial and uh, the understanding of the specification, I think this is a good change to make. However, I wanted to make sure that we, uh, do, uh, that we do not uh, lose some of the security, the security properties, or that we introduce uh, a vulnerability into the protocol by removing the connection identifiers from cryptographic protection, as this is what the current PR, PR does. Uh, essentially, the connection identifiers are moved to the transport layer and they are then removed from the inner structures that are mapped, that are protected cryptographically. So I would just like to open for discussion if there is any way that this could be security relevant. I don't think so. I think these are purely transport things that we have put into ad hoc to as a hope to make things simpler and when they were in ad hoc they were they were added to max just by the principle of adding everything in the ad hoc message uh, to the max so i i don't see a problem to removing them and it's already clear today that with some of the correlation parameters like zero I don't remember if it's zero or three, you don't send any connection identifiers at all, and it's purely a transport thing. Um, but I think it's a good discussion. Yes, but they were yeah. still, yeah, uh, yes, I agree with that, uh, with that statement, but then they were still included in the transcript hash, right? But, but they are, I mean, the, the negotiation of connection identifiers is still there. But right. it's not protected cryptographically. This is what. Yes, it is. I mean, they they, they are they, they were present. In, they were present in two places. I mean, they were present both. Both we have the actual negotiation of connection identifiers, uh, which were in the end of the messages, and then we have the initial the message initial connection identifiers, which were used just for finding, uh, sort of retrieving. When I receive the message, I, I look at the initial. Field, I see there's a connection identifier, and then I use that to retrieve the right context, which is, which is just what you could uh, substitute with with some other methods for finding the right context. Yeah, uh, the parameters CI and CR that are the negotiation of um, sender and recipient ID for OSCORE, which uh, is still definitely integrity protected and, and must be. Okay, so this is where my confusion uh, comes from. So I will have to go back and double check that in the PR. But if that is indeed protected, okay. I mean, I edit in, edit in terms of the editorial uh, readiness and uh, clearness of the PR, it looks pretty good to me. Okay, great. So that would be my personal comment on that. I don't know if anyone else has had a chance to take a look at the PR. I looked high level at it. I think it looked good, but I would like to have a more uh, detailed review of the changes. Yes, definitely, definitely. For I mean, I would think it should be merged. Yes, my comment was mainly on the structure because, I mean, obviously, when you see the PR and the details of how Christian uh, had envisioned this, it makes much more sense than to just generically discussing this uh, over during a call. So that was that I was referring to that. So, yes, we should definitely keep it open for a little bit more and then uh, keep the discussion going on the on the PR. 
Good. So, so what should should we set a date for this so so we can hopefully I mean if, if no one objects we could merge it for the next version. Yes, the two weeks maybe. Is this enough? So, sounds reasonable. Then we have time to do the merge so, before. Yeah. Before the yeah. So this would be mid June, and then. Uh, yeah, I think that's plenty of time for people to comment. Maybe we should just ping the mailing list because this is hidden in the GitHub PR. Yeah. So yeah. Good. Uh, who gets that action? Uh, okay, I can do that. So <laughs> thank <right>. you. <laughs> Let's write let's write down in the minutes that an action point for militia to ping the mailing list pointing to the PR one seventeen and that comments are welcome. Good. Okay, so yeah, next any... time. Unless there are more comments. Yeah, I hear none, so yeah, let's proceed. Okay, so um, the changes so far we've discussed here has, and, and the others that are, are in, this, uh, in this session, has uh, no or minor impact on the message sizes. I mean, I mean in fact, we, we've come to that. There's a discussion about identification of connection identifiers and, and key identifiers, which is also somehow impacting single bytes of messages and then that led us in the design team meeting led us to the discussion about what what kind of uh, impacts on message sizes are acceptable uh, and we then had to go back and recap what were the target message sizes and where are we in our in our byte count so as you as you know the the protocol the three messages message two is the largest message currently at 46 bytes and looking at the benchmarks, which we did, uh, it's now two years ago, I think, um, for which was based on, on uh, Naraband IoT, uh, LoRa1, and Sixtish, uh, a Sixtish five node benchmark. The most severe restriction came out of this particular benchmark, it was 45 bytes downlink. And then uh, Malisha went back and revisited the, those calculations and have compiled a spreadsheet. You can find the link to that if you want to take a look uh, in issue 103. And it, I mean, it's clear that there are a number of assumptions behind this uh, 45 bytes. Uh, and there are, there are different options and you will get slightly different message sizes. So, um, and at the same time, we know that we haven't reached the optimum message size in terms of uh, message two. We can, for example, uh, concatenate two of the message fields, the, uh, the ephemeral key and the ciphertext into one Seabor byte string, uh, which would save one byte. So we would get down to these 45 bytes. But, but then this is, I mean, this is actually going in the opposite direction to, to the type of changes that we are making now in the specification. We are removing complexity, uh, potentially at the cost of of single bytes. So that led us then again to the discussion, uh, are we really right on, on these benchmarks? Uh, should we interpret them exactly on the byte as given uh, to us in the, from the discussion two years ago? Or what is, uh, are we happy with adding single bytes uh, in the interest of making this a protocol which is simple to simplify? <laughs> simple to, to um, implement in, in constrained devices, which is actually the original uh, purpose. Another option could yeah. it be that it's 44 bytes and we really, really need to concatenate these things to make it fit. Yeah, another conclusion could be exactly, could be the opposite, that this is extremely important uh, to, to make this optimization. So, but we, I think we need to open up that discussion now and, and uh, because we need to nail down the message formats and that will uh, sort of hit single bytes in one, by, one way or the other. So what, what do people think? Uh, 
Yeah, so maybe I can comment on this as well, since this is mostly relevant to the six six benchmark. And as a recap at the time, we were requested to give some hard hard limits on message sizes when the working when we were discussing the formation of the working group. So we did those calculations at the time and we came up with the most reasonable assumption uh, in terms of six dish multi hop networks that consider five five nodes in a linear topology. So essentially four hops, uh, four hops deep network uh, in uh, in the joint setting, essentially that relates to uh, the network formation uh, use case when a new node that, that we refer to as the pledge wants to join the network and where we have special constraints on overhead uh, due to co-op proxying that we use in six -tish. So uh, what is important to stress in terms of uh, this benchmark or the, of this uh, figure of 45 bytes is that, as Joran said, it takes into account a lot of assumptions uh, on different network settings. And uh, if you want to uh, see the details, these are all available in the spreadsheet uh, that is publicly available. Uh, where you can play with different settings and see how they affect the overhead in uh, during join or without join with uh, with uh, short addressing at the link layer, whether the uh, the devices in the network from the same vendor or not, which allows us to to compress uh, to compress layer two addresses and save some bytes, etc. So the bottom line is that uh, the five node benchmark that we did is interesting, but this is by no means a hard limit. Uh, not meeting the 45 byte uh, in message two would simply mean in six dish that this message would get fragmented when traveling on, the le on, the, uh, on this particular hop where the message message is too is too large so it wouldn't prevent the protocol from from running uh, obviously and it would a little bit influence the performance we still don't know by how much this would influence the performance but uh in terms of functionality this would still work and obviously for uh smaller networks with four nodes this would all fit into the uh, into the single single la la layer two frames. So I'm a little split uh, in terms of this, what uh, what to give as a guidance here, because uh, I'm very familiar with the six dish network, and this is uh, a figure that we gave during the formation of the working group, 45 bytes. So it would indeed be very nice if we could fit messages into those uh, into those limits. But I do not have a strong opinion, and my personal preference is that we should not over optimize in order for, to meet this particular use case. Okay. So I, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, sorry. Uh, so if I recall, those limits were one of the reasons why the people interested in compressed TLS kind of didn't win the argument necessarily. So um, I think you want, you know, I think you need to factor in that if you're going to start treating what was a hard limit as not a hard limit, uh, then that might cause some more discussion later. Okay, I think that's a good point, Stephen. So, yeah, yeah, so. So this is definitely not a hard limit in terms of the functionality of the network. This is a hard limit. It was seen as a hard limit during those discussions that we had. This is a fact. And I agree that if we now change this, and we consider it a soft one that it could raise uh, the arguments down the road during the ISG evaluation and whether everything that we were doing all makes sense. So uh, that's why I said that I'm quite split. So if so, my understanding is that we can meet this 45 byte limit by 
concatenating the ephemeral key in ciphertext. But is that right? Uh, yes. And then we had other uh, possible optimizations that we could do in I order think, to meet. Yeah. I think there is one more. I think you can do some optimization inside the ciphertext, similar to this concatenation, uh, and get down to 44 byte. Uh, if we approve Christian's sod, then the no, uh, PR, then the um, then the official number for ad hoc will um, will go down one byte also, but it will not affect the actual practical message uh, sizes that you see on the wire because you will still need that byte, but it will be outside of of ad hoc. So you are saying that the ad hoc message size, uh, strictly speaking, will be 40, 45 bytes because you will move out the connection identifier out yeah. from the official message, from the formal message structure. Yes. Uh, I, 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 I don't think that, I mean, that would mean that you would, since you are looking at overhead in co on top of co-op in, in your model, Malisha, you yes. would have to add the byte It there. would be the so, same thing. Yes, yes. So that would wouldn't change thing. anything. Yes, I agree, I agree. Um, so no, but I'm. I think this is a good discussion, and um, I'm. I'm. I'm a little bit hesitant. Also, as as you remember, the, these numbers came about that that people said that well, you need to have a, a strict, a sort of a you need to have a, a de definite target. It's saying as as small as possible is not a, a, an engineerable target. So you need to have a limit. So that's where these limits came from. Although it's it's always known that if you want to have strict limits, you you make a lot of assumptions. I'm a bit hesitant to how we should interpret these limits. I I I think we don't want to have a sort of a discussion where where we are changing limits um, arbitrarily um, because uh, uh, yeah for, for obvious reasons. But but mm -hmm. I think that um, I think that the changing these sing, sort of adding single bytes. I don't think that really changes the argument. We are still Quite far away from the from the compressed TLS sizes, so, so it, it wouldn't be sort of it wouldn't be the byte that makes the difference, I think. But but we will we might expose ourselves to that discussion, and we, we might not want to do that. Yeah, I don't know. Do, uh, I think the recent discussion has been that maybe we can these things that was the. The byte string identifier that has been identified as a complex way to do save a few bytes. I think recent discussion has more been that we can actually reformulate this and do it quite simple and keep the byte, um, the number of bytes. Um, I assume we come to that maybe on a later slide. But yeah, yeah a later slide. I, don't know. I think the question is, but that's up for discussion also but otherwise i think is the should we do this concatenation to save one more byte um, that's the question yeah i don't think it has any i assume the size of the y will always be known so i don't think it has any downsides if if something like pqc was introduced in the future you probably need to make bigger changes than just putting them into gy anyway so so my personal view uh on the next steps for this for this issue is that we should maybe park this issue for now mm -hmm. yeah. until we are completely sure that we can ship ad hoc and that the specification is frozen. Yeah. And at that very moment, then I guess we can see, okay, in order to meet this hard limit that was used as an argument during the working group formation with the TLS working group and the TLS uh, guys, then we can finally decide if we want to make this to incorporate this optimization into the protocol and which specific which specific optimization to reach the limit
Would that make sense? Makes sense to me. Yeah, it's fine. I just wonder at what, when do we, I mean, is this, is this an, can we take this as an interim meeting? Uh, does it matter if it's an interim meeting or if it's an uh, official ITF meeting? Because we would like to have a decision by September, I suppose, so that we can, that at least so I, lose, lose target for, for completing the spec. Yes, so I mean, I mean, I see this just okay. You see this, I mean, the core of the protocol frozen. We, we are absolutely sure that we do not need to add any more bytes here and there to for different features by then that might come up by then. Mm -hmm. And at this very point, okay, we decide let's do this particular optimization run. Mm -hmm. So this depends on on you when you want to declare on you as the author team when you want to declare the specification as ready. So this mm -hmm. is how I see. I don't know if this is confusing or. So, so maybe we could the way we could address this is to say that when we get to the point of working group last call, we'll explicitly ask people to consider: Are there any more bytes we can squeeze out? Yes. Yeah, or, or 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 is it acceptable to add a byte? Because I think that's the contention, right? If if we actually add a byte to simplify the specification, but we go beyond the magical forty-five bytes that's been with us for so long. Okay, so you are proposing to make this change now to incorporate it into the working version? No, no. Sorry, sorry, Manish. I, I didn't con contradict what you said. You, I agree with no. what you said. I just added to what my, what Stephen said. What the question we should ask the working group at the time of of uh, when we are sort of before working group last call. No, no. I mean, I think we are fully in line here. It's just like the phrasing. I mean, my understanding what you were saying. If we want to increase the at the time of the last call, if we want to add one byte. Which would mean doing this change now. So right now in the working version, we are at 45 bytes, and then during the last call we decide or not to add that additional byte, or we keep the 46 bytes message to now, and then at the time of the last call we do the the, the change and uh, reduce it. Yeah, I think I prefer the latter. I think that that makes sense, most sense because this is, I mean. We do want to use CBOR as is. We don't want to concatenate things and, and squeeze out those bytes. Um, so I think it, it's more natural to keep it as it is and then ask the question at the end. That works for me. Steven? Sure. Okay. Yep. So I, I guess, yeah. So with this, I guess we do not make a decision on this. So we just continue. We park the issue for now and then do, at the time of the last call, as Steven said, we decide if we want to optimize for this one byte. Yes, fine. Maybe I misunderstood what you said previously. This, I'm, I'm, I'm happy with the conclusion anyway. Okay. Next. Right, so this is the one. Uh, do you want to take this one as well, John, or should I? Uh, I, I can take it i guess i have been most involved in this discussion so uh, one way that uh, that ad hoc saves a lot quite a lot of bytes at least in total a uh, one to two per message is to to transform byte strings into integers which have a one small integers which have a one byte uh, on the wire representation in CBOR. And this is used in the document for the connection identifiers as well as ID cred uh, when that is a KID, a key identifier. Uh, so these one byte byte strings with CBOR are two bytes on the wire. But if you represent them as a small integer, they have a one byte representation. So this saves, I think, five bytes in total if you sum up the messages. Uh, but this has also been pointed out as 
the biggest over optimization in in head -hook. it makes the there's been a lot of questions about this and uh, also people in companies we have talked to be outside is like wow why are you, why are you doing this this looks really strange do you really need to do this optimization and then you explain them that we really need to uh, match 45 bytes for 60 and then they understand but it's uh, i think one of the most complicated points uh, and then there has been <clears throat> some suggestions uh, from Christian and one suggestion is to instead of stating that this is a byte string from the beginning and then define how you uh, transform it into an integer uh, the suggestion is that you just specify that the connection identifier is either a byte string or an integer uh, and uh, I think this uh, this simplifies things now. Now, now that P, I think there was a PR for this also, but that didn't went through as all the connection identifiers have now been moved. And there is a similar suggestion that has been discussed in an issue for the kid. Uh, maybe we can instead of defining that kid is. Uh, transform to an integer, maybe we can either expand the cozy kid to include byte string and integer or define a separate kid parameter that uh, allows both. Uh, and uh, I think that's basically more or less the whole um, uh, some more discussion then in the design meeting, these were discussed and it was identified that in, in some cases, a single one byte identifier, which could be the empty byte string is enough. Because this server, as you have asymmetry, you have a lot of clients and maybe one server, uh, one of them can use, um, one side can use the one byte identifier. Um, which would be in message two, and you're still fine. You don't need to have this integer uh, transformation at all or expand anything. Uh, but that might only be true for the connection identifiers. For the for the kid, maybe you need two if you want to support a key update from an old to new key. Um, but I think th these are all ongoing discussions and a bit related to the moving of the um, connection identifiers to to an appendix. Yeah, thanks, thanks, John. It, I I just wondered. Um, so we need to progress this somehow. There is a PR. This hundred twenty two, which is doing the changes and is also indicating what happens on in OSCORE because for OSCORE we are uh, using the connection identifiers as sender identifiers and those needs to be byte strings and those needs to be non-overlapping so they have to be different and therefore you need to make sure that what that the mapping you do between uh, byte string and int to this sender identifier does not collide. That processing is moved somehow out of the definition of bit string identifier where that where it took place before into the mapping uh, to sender identifiers. Uh, and we need to progress this. What do we do here? Uh, in, in, in particular in light of the discussion we had on the previous slides on message sizes. Uh, because this might then add a byte to the kid, uh, or might not. And if we think now that we that 45 is a hard limit, then maybe we don't want to do this. Maybe we want to keep the bit string identifier. I don't know. That's just my sentiments after listening to to you in the 
previous discussion? Yeah, uh, no, I think you simplified them. I think the option is to keep the current or expand it so that connection identifier is byte string or int. Uh, that would not uh, increase uh, the um, the um, uh, that would not increase message size at all. Um, and then uh, and then I think the third option is to just delete the integral transformation and maybe it's concluded that a single one byte is actually enough and then it would also not increase uh, message sizes. So I don't think the choices are keep byte string identifier or increase message sizes. You're right, you're right. So absolutely for, for, for connection identifiers, we can do this change, I think. Um, for the kids, we probably need to think a little bit more. So the, the replacing bistro identifier with bistro or int does not change anything because bistro identifier is bistro or int. So the, the question really is whether you have a transformation from a byte string with a single byte that happens to be uh, less than, than 48, um, uh, actually less than 49, um, into uh, uh, an int and back. So if you say uh, you can have ints there, you just have increased the, the space of uh, potential values that you can put there. Yeah, yeah, you're right. All, all, the, all the protocols that want to use ad hoc that specify what they put in there, uh, have to make a decision how to handle this. So they could say, we only allow int, we only allow byte strings, where they could say, we can only allow byte strings of uh, seven bytes or more. I mean, they, they can define that in, in any way they want. Yeah, I, I think, thank you for Karsten for, for bringing some, some reason into the discussion here, uh, for, for at least from for, uh, into my comment. I, I, I'm not complaining on John. I'm complaining on my my own comment. There. So I think this is so, this is great. Yes, yeah, go ahead. So my point of view is that uh, this uh, flexibility is probably useful. Uh, yes, it is added complexity, and uh, that becomes uh, really a question of uh, uh, complexity versus functionality. But I think the current the current specification is also a cause of complexity and confusion. Um, at least it used to be a lot of confusion. Don't know if it is anymore. Well, removing the the automatic transform reduces complexity from my point of view. Yeah, I agree. I think that's a good change. So it just means that the API now has that choice. Yeah. Okay. Any other comments on this? Are we in favor of making this replacement? No, I hear no, nothing else. No objection. So should we do the same for this PR as for the one we had previously that we should give a, uh, a little time and then people are allowed to comment and if they don't object then we... This is uh, very much overlapping and uh, or <laughs> this cannot be merged at the same time as Christian's PR. So, And I don't know if this PR is... I don't remember what Christian's PR do regarding these things. Maybe this is not needed at all and Christian's PR already do these things, but yeah. Um, I guess we could do this change without doing Christian change. I don't understand. This is Christian's PR, 122. Okay. So there were there are actually two PRs, which is making, you made one. Uh, mm -hmm. And then Christian didn't see her, and he made one on his own. And okay, they are, okay. they are very the similar, but there is, yeah. Okay. Uh, this is a little bit more uh, 
um, yeah, the there is an intersection which is very similar, and then there is more stuff in this in this below. Is this PR aligned with the change, the, the move with the connection identifier to an appendix or not? I think both are based on the master branch. So I, I think the, I think that it's it's done with the mindset that that both will be merged. Yeah. But, but it's not. But they are done on the on the master branch both. Okay, so but in the, independently, I think we need to review this, and I think it's good if we have a time time limit. Yeah. So, but but we could we could note, I think, if, if there, unless there are any objection, we note that there is a there is an, uh, a positive um, feedback from the meeting that we actually make this replacement and, and move the potential complexity to, to the API rather than keeping it in the protocol where you, you have to have it. I mean, you, as, as Carson said, if, if you decide on just using bit strings and, or byte strings, then, then you will not have, you don't have to pay the complexity price at all. Okay, um, I hear no, so, no objections. So maybe let's open two week window for to comment on this before we close it yeah if yep. you, if, if, you, if you anyway send the mail to the mail list yes please add this pr on the list of things to review okay you're referring to the previous yeah email yeah okay thanks okay so let's let's move on then simplify my yeah so this um this is uh, again a simplification. This is John's uh, insight that uh, we are currently defining the inner max based on cosy encrypt zero, and it's it's a it's a uh, it's it's the way you do cosy encrypts. You have to define all all the things that are part of it: the com the protected header, the external AAD, what is the plain text, what is the key, what is the nonce, etc. And what we really can do uh, is to replace this with a single single invocation of, of the KDF, which makes a lot uh, of things simpler uh, in terms of specification. And it also uh, avoids potential issues if you would use the new COSI AADs without MAC, which are, are discussed and, and planned to be defined. Uh, John, do you want to say anything about this? Yeah, there's uh, more reasons why this might be a good idea. The, the list of so Kartik requested an overview of like security levels, and one of the things <clears throat> so ad hoc is high level, very similar to TLS. Both are and also Ike V2. All of them are based on Sigma, uh, but one, the main part where ad hoc has significantly, ad hoc has significantly smaller max than, than TLS. I think that's maybe the most biggest uh, difference identified. I think TLS might have a bit overkill there with extremely large max, but ad hoc might have a little bit too small, allowing bigger might be good. So this would, um, this can be done completely without increasing message size. So instead of having an eight, eight byte Mac in uh, that is signed, you could have a 32 byte Mac uh, that is signed. Uh, not sure if it's needed for security, but it doesn't hurt. Uh, also, in the current ad hoc protocol, the tag in the encryption part of Sigma is the same as the tag length now in the Mac part of, uh, of Sigma, which uh, is a simplification, but might not allow the flexibility 
that you want. So by replacing a COSI MAC by simply using the HTDF uh, SHA-256 that is already part of uh, ad hoc, the KDF. Uh, you, can, um, you can also, you can generate bigger Macs for the signature version and you can increase the flexibility so the cipher suit can actually um, mm, determine the Mac length independent of the tag length in the AAD. It also significantly shortens the specification. I think you can remove at least a page of the specification uh, by this simplification. Okay, it does anyone have? I think that um, unless there are any specific questions, this is something that we will hear more from in the security review from 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 INRIA at some point. And I think, but I think the step is it's really a natural step to make at this this point. Yes, I was going to make the same point that uh, we should definitely just check the security implications of the change uh, in terms of the simplification of the specification. This looks really good. Uh, security wise, I think it, it increases the security, if anything, yeah. whether that security increase is like necessary or not, uh, I'm not sure, but it, it increases the security, security level of the Mac part that is included in the signature. Uh, so I'm missing, how does it increase the security? It increases the Mac length. Where did that oh, just the Mac length? Okay. Yeah, that is then signed. Okay. Yeah. So the Mac is not sent. That's the point. It's not. It's not sent. It's an inner Mac basically. But it's. Yeah. You can add the length. You could sort of have a longer Mac that's been signed. Yeah. Uh, it increases one of the internal security parameters in the protocol. Makes it. Uh, much more aligned with TLS, whether it affects any practical security uh, of the like outs properties of the protocol itself in the end, I'm not sure, but it, I, I think it, it rather strengthens the security than weakens it, even if it's a, a, sig a simplification. Yeah. Understood. Yeah, so yeah, we sh let's double check with uh, Kartik and his team in any case, and but it seems like a good change to make. Yeah. Can we, there was excellent comments from Kartik and his team uh, regarding uh, the, the, the transcript hash and the key derivations on, uh, are we expecting more more comments <laughs> from them, like so the short depend. term, yes. or or will it be like long term after after the draft has been work frozen and they will do verification or? Uh, yeah. So this is, I mean, this was a result of a joint session that we had internally in Inria, yeah. because we are currently uh, uh, I'm currently working on implementing ad hoc in a ver in a subset of Rust that is called Hackspec that allows uh, Kartik's team to produce, to formally verify the C implementation that Timothy uh, has developed. So essentially this is a Rust implementation. So we had a couple of uh, joint sessions where we were discussing essentially the implementation, how can we best organize this implementation in Rust that is Hackspec. And then uh, during these sessions, I mean, essentially, while we were wor we were working out the details, uh, these comments uh, came out. So we, we we will have these sessions in future. I cannot tell you right now about the timeline. I mean, this depends a lot on other activities that we are having. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Okay. I think we can go to the last slide. So this was uh, again a, a, an item brought up in the design team discussion. Very good input. Uh, there was a question about the uh, the currently defined 
Cypher Suites. So, um, so we, there are four CCM-based Cypher Suites. There are no Chacha Poli Cypher Suites. Uh, so that was two of the comments. Uh, and there is also the, was also the comment about whether we actually should allocate one byte value to the, this CNSA Cypher Suite, which is really for high security settings and could afford another byte value if you want to save one byte values for Cypher Suites. Um, so that, I think that would, there were three very good questions and I don't, I don't think we have any, uh, I got any more inputs on that, but th this is a time to discuss it. Uh, there are some questions here. Anyone has an opinion? John, do you want to complement what I said with some something? I think it's very good comments raised by Christian. I'm not sure these are the four correct one or that we even need so many CCM based. I definitely think a Chacha Poly uh, surface suit should be added. And yeah, I think the CNS I can probably have a two byte identifier. That has a lot of larger overhead anyway, as it has bigger signatures and uh, bigger max and tags and so on. So. Does anyone have an opinion on this? So there is a proposal then for for the two set, two last ones. We changed the two byte value. We we define the cipher suite value with these algorithms. Yes. So on my side, yeah. Uh, chair hat off obviously uh yeah i mean this high security cypher suite definitely i don't think deserves a one byte value so i i think this is low hanging fruit uh then uh regarding charcha 20 uh i received requests from uh the developers active in the uh in the riot space in for the riot operating system about uh the use of charcha poly if ad hoc is support. So I referred them to the mailing list to request it. I don't think they ever did, but this, I mean, I think this is, ob I mean, that we should add uh, Chacha Poly to the, to the Cypher suites. Uh, I'm just not, so you are proposing here to add a single suite with Chacha Poly based on the Edwards curve. Uh, so, I mean, my question is, okay, why not with the NIST curves as well? And then regarding the CCM, we have the, on our side, I mean, the CCM, we have a 13 byte non CCM that is, uh, that is supported. So this is the one that we care in terms of 802.15.4, because we have those hardware accelerators readily available. And then for the others, I guess we should keep them for now. On. I think it was not. I think there was not a discussion to whether it was the right variant of CCM. I think COSI defines like eight different variants of CCM or something. So I think ad hoc only specifies CypherSuit for a 13 byte nonce version. I think that's as it should be. But I think the question yes, was this is, should... is these four combinations of CCM with the other algorithms are these the correct cipher suite combinations and does it really need to be four um, i don't okay have okay it would be helpful if you had listed here those combinations uh so i don't have to look them up uh but i suppose this refers to the combination with uh, the 13 byte nonce that is the mti's uh a um, authenticated encryption uh, algorithm uh, in oscor with uh, the Edwards curve, with the NIST curve, P256, mm. and, yes. uh, and then two others, what do they refer to? Uh, I think it's the same two, but with 16 byte max in ad hoc. Just longer max, okay, yeah. yeah longer okay, max in ad hoc, but not longer max in OSCORE, if I remember the cipher suits correctly. Okay, I see. To me personally, those make sense. I don't know if anyone else has comments. 
Um, I guess any, I guess somebody needs to come with a proposal, what could be removed and what is wrong and what should change if, uh, if yeah. we do any changes here. Otherwise I would guess we, but you, you like all the four that are currently there, Malaysia, you think they should stay? I think it's worth having them, definitely. I mean, this is, That's I mean, input. yeah. Yeah, I'm, that, this is just purely speaking from the 802.15.4 uh, side in terms of the hardware accelerator. I mean, this is the hardware accelerator that is used on the, on the link layer. So in many cases, if it's in the microcontroller, we can reuse it for the application. So it definitely makes sense to keep those. Uh, and so I guess as the next steps for this particular issue on on the first point, we keep as is for now, and we look for input. If anyone has other requests, on point two, uh, my my suggestion would be to add Chacha Poly both with the NIST curve and with the Edwards curve. Yeah. And then for point three, I think this is straightforward. Yeah. Um, I think point one might. I think we need to revisit the uh, the cipher suits if we do this um, uh, changed Mac calculation in the previous slide. Um, oh, the one with KDF. Uh, yeah, exactly. But I think the cipher suit. Uh, yes, the cipher suit definition is probably staying the same. But I need. Uh, I think the, at least we need to re look them through because now this the algorithms are set the AA the algorithms are set as because they are both uh, encryption and Mac when you par talks about Sigma so it, yeah yeah saying that th that change might make us want to revisit some part of the cipher suits but um, let's come back to that yeah. Yes, yes, and coming back to that particular uh, to that particular proposal on using KDF instead of the cozy Mac, mm. uh, uh, I guess one. I mean, it's not uh, cozy Mac. It's cozy encrypt. Yes, to... cozy encrypt with yes, using the cozy encrypt structure to 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 Mac the uh, to Mac the 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 bytes. Uh, so uh, I'm. I guess what. What is important there, from my point of view at least, is that the cipher suite that is used by ad hoc uh, self-contains the security level by the protocol, so that the cipher suite is directly affects the length of the MAC, even if you use the KDF there, yes. just to MAC. So, I don't know if I was clear, but just that, I mean, the goal here is that the security level is fully determined by the chosen cipher suite. Yes. Okay. I, I think in the, in the signature case, I think the, uh, the right choice of Mac length, it just, uh, the output length of the uh, HKDF. You don't need to truncate anything. I, as in the in the Diffie Hellman case, I don't know if you should define it as a separate parameter or if you should still define it in terms of like the tag length of the uh, encryption algorithm. I haven't looked into what could make most sense. Okay, so but, could but you, could, it should be com completely determined by the cipher suite. Yes, 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 yeah. that is my point. Yeah, okay. Do we have any other comments on this issue? Okay, I hear none. I guess this was the last slide for today. Is that right? End of presentation. Yes, it very much is. So uh, with that, uh, I guess we uh, yes. So the only remaining item on the agenda is any other business. Does anyone want to raise anything for discussion?
Okay, I hear nothing. So uh, I guess in terms of the next steps, uh, uh, we have the ITF 111 meeting uh, upcoming end of July. We still don't have the session scheduled. So ITF 111 is scheduled between uh, July 26th and July 30th. Uh, uh, I guess so. Do we need the meeting before then? Or I don't think I think would be it's enough with the, we just keep with that schedule. Is there any objection on not meeting without before ITF 111 meeting? Okay, I hear none. Uh, I would just like to thank Rickard for taking notes. Uh, I mean, this this looks absolutely fantastic. So thank you so much for jumping in. Uh, and yes, I see Stephen has already done that in the chat. <laughs> Thanks, Stephen. <laughs> uh, okay, so uh, we are six minutes to go until the top of the hour with none. Uh, discussion items left, I guess we can conclude the meeting. Thank you very much for attending and uh, we we will send the follow up on the mailing list with the action points and the link to the minutes and the materials that were discussed and the recording obviously. So thank you again and talk to you at ITF 111. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 B